Do you need to know how to use the inventory feature in QuickBooks Online? Do you need to manage your merchandise by using some of the robust reports that track quantities on hand? Well then you need to watch this video a little bit every day. How to use the inventory feature in QuickBooks Online. My name is Mark Smolin. I'm the founder and CEO of Worldwide QuickBooks. I personally guarantee you the clearest possible explanation for every single topic that you could need to learn in order to use the QuickBooks Online Inventory feature for merchandise management. In this video lecture, you will learn how to activate the inventory feature. You will learn how to set up all lists for merchandise transactions. You will experience every possible merchandise inventory transaction there is. And you will even learn about special issues like adjusting inventory and so on. These special inventory issues also include a discussion of the difference between perpetual versus periodic inventory system and it also includes a discussion about inventory valuation system of which QuickBooks Online uses the FIFO system to value the inventory. In fact, you'll even learn about non-inventory parts so that you will have every option available to you when deciding how to manage your inventory when using QuickBooks Online. And if all that is not enough, you still have the benefit of a live teacher because I answer all my students' questions immediately and all you have to do is leave your questions in the comments section below. You will be an expert in inventory management in QuickBooks Online if you watch a little bit of this video every day and reach out to me for any questions you might have. All of this right here on YouTube and it's all free, free, free. So what does the inventory feature in QuickBooks Online actually do? Well, we know that the profit and loss of a service company could have as few as one number in the income section of the company's profit and loss. Then, of course, you would subtract the expenses to find the net income. However, if the company is a merchandise company, the profit and loss will have an income section that will be split into three parts. Instead of just service income representing the money that comes from the customer, you will instead have sales income. And that will be the money that the customer gives you for the merchandise that they're buying. You also have to account for this other very important number called cost of goods sold. You have to subtract that from your sales income because that represents the money that you paid for what you gave to the customer. So the real amount of income is in a number called gross profit. And gross profit is simply the difference between the money the customer gave you and what you paid for what you gave the customer. And then, of course, from the gross profit, you would subtract your expenses to find your final net income. This very important number can represent the profit of all your goods together or you can actually track the profit of each item you buy and sell separately. For example, instead of having summary numbers like this, if you happen to buy and sell apples and also buy and sell bananas, you can have all three numbers just for your Apple products so you can see the profit only from buying and selling apples and right there at the top of the income statement you'll be able to compare that to your profit from buying and selling bananas. This way you can compare all three numbers and the ultimate profitability 
of each individual item that you buy and sell. That gives you a lot more detail in the income section of your profit and loss. And of course, all of this is only accurate if this one special number, cost of goods sold, is accurate. And you will learn in this video that in order to keep your cost of goods sold correct, you must track the quantities on hand of your merchandise products continuously. That's why this feature provides special inventory reports that will track quantities in different ways. This report that you will get when you activate your inventory feature will show you the quantity of each inventory transaction and its effect on the balance of inventory. And it will also show you how many of that item you have remaining on hand after each purchase. This way, you'll be able to tell how many are physically present without going and counting every time, and you'll always be able to tell your customers if you have enough of the item in stock to be able to sell it to them or have them wait for later. In fact, these reports can even show you what the quantity on hand was at a specific moment in the past, and you will see why that is a very important piece of information to know. Now, there are many more benefits for using the inventory feature in QuickBooks Online, and each video chapter in this video will show you another QuickBooks Online idea that relates to inventory. And speaking of chapters, if you click in the description field below the video, you can open it up by clicking the Show More button if you don't see the whole description and you're watching this from a computer. When you click Show More, it will open up the description field and you will see the table of contents. And if you look at the table of contents, you'll be able to click at a particular time index for any of the video chapters you want to see in this video and the video will jump to that chapter so you can go directly to the topic you need. And you can also sign up for a free 30-day trial for QuickBooks Online by using the link in either the description field under this video or the link might also be in the comments section below. If you sign up, you can follow along step by step as you use your new account and you will see how we set up together in order to make this video fun and easy. So just stay with me and by the time you finish this video, you will be an expert in QuickBooks Online regarding using the inventory feature. Chapter 3, Setting Up to Follow Along in the Inventory Course. You don't have to follow along step by step in order to learn well in this course, but it would be much more fun and you might learn better if you take a moment to set up so that you can follow along with me. Just sign up and set up and we will both have the same things after each video chapter and it will make the learning easy and fun. So you would start by clicking the show more button to open up the description field right under the video and right on top you should see the link to sign up for the free 30-day trial plus version. Remember you must make sure that you sign up for the plus version of the software in order to get the inventory feature. If you just take a quick moment to input a few customer names and a few vendor names, then you'll be all set up and I'll show you the best reports to use and then we're ready to go. So here are the three customers that we will use in our transaction examples. 
and all you have to do is put them on the customer list in the customer section after you sign up for the new plus version of QuickBooks Online. Here are the vendors that we will use and we will purchase both services and merchandise from these vendors and all we need are the names. Remember, only the names are relevant and everything else you can practice later. And now, after you put in all the customers and vendors, I'm now going to show you how to customize and set aside all the important reports that we will use for the course. The best report, no matter what you're learning in QuickBooks, is the trial balance. And we want the trial balance to show the results of all transactions regardless of date. So this is what we would do. In the left panel, we would click Reports. Now, here are the standard reports, and we will put the ones that we want in the Custom Reports section. So click Standard, and scroll down, and let's find the trial balance. You might have to scroll very far down to the Accountants section. For my, see, you're, it's in the section of For My Accountant, all the way down. Trial Balance, click on it. Now, of course, it's empty because we haven't done anything yet. Let's just close the little help. But we want to change this pull down to All Dates and then click Run Report. Now the trial balance will show us the results of all transaction regardless of date. Now that it looks the way we want it to look, click Save Customization, and then again we have a choice to change the name, but we won't. Just click Save. And now if you click Reports and click Custom Reports, you'll see the trial balance is here, and all we have to do is go to Custom Reports if we want to find anything. And we can click and it opens exactly the way we saved it with all dates. Let's again click reports. Now what's the next report? The profit and loss. Very important to look at when we're studying inventory. So we go to the standard report, you know, you know reports, standard reports, and profit and loss is actually right here. Let's just click on it. But it only shows year to date. Click the pull down date menu and choose all dates. Now that it's showing the results of all transactions regardless of date, then we will click save customization. And again, we could change the name, but let's leave it and just click save. So now when we click reports, custom report, we have these two reports and they will help us find everything that we entered and they will also show us the results of the transactions that we put into QuickBooks Online. What's next? Transaction list by customer and transaction list by vendor. Okay, so they're very easy to find and put in so we click reports. In the area of standard reports just go slowly. Who owes you? No, it's not here. It's under the section of Sales and Customers. Transaction List by Customer. Click on it. Make sure that the pull-down says All Dates. Then Run Report. And now that it shows all the dates, click Save Customization and then click Save. Let's do the same thing for Vendors. Reports. Click Standard. Go all the way down, go slowly, but go all the way down to the vendor section, Expense and Vendors, Transaction List by Vendor. Click on it, and then we change the date pull down to All Dates, Run Report, and now it says All Dates, Save Customization, and Save. What you must be accustomed to is if you're trying to find a transaction that you entered, you can click Reports and click the Custom Report area and using one of these four reports will help us find anything that we previously entered very quickly and very easily.
Now you may have noticed that I already changed the name to Holden the Fruit Guy, but let me show you how this is done. We will use the account settings, and for some of you this is called company settings, but it's in the same place, and it does the same thing. And you will learn more about the account settings window in a future video. But for now, let's just do this. Go to the top right and click the cog wheel, then go all the way to the left where it says either account settings or company settings, depending on which version of QuickBooks you signed up for. When you click here, you get the area of defaults and options that control the entire account. And you will notice if you click in the left panel, there are different categories of company settings. The one we will change is this, company, and there are different sections in the company settings. We're changing the company name, so you would have to click this pencil tool, and again, you would have to type in cap locks, hold in the fruit guy because he sells fruit. Click save, see it changed it, then click done, and now when you go back to your dashboard it should say hold in the fruit guy, the company that buys and sells fruits. Chapter 4 Activating the Inventory Feature you must enable your QuickBooks Online account to track quantities of the inventory items that you buy and sell. You must do this in the Account Settings window, which is also called the Company Settings window, depending on what subscription of QuickBooks Online you have. The Settings window controls the defaults, the options, and activates features to be used in the QuickBooks Online account. What happens when you activate quantities? Well, inventory items will be available on the products and services list. You saw in the previous video that only non-inventory parts were available, but after you activate inventory, when you go back to the products and service list, you will have an option to add inventory items. Inventory reports will be available in the reports section and additional inventory activities will be available in the pull-down menus. If we go back to clicking the cog wheel and come over to the products and service list that we were in in the previous video, you can see that if we click New, there is no inventory type available. That's because it's grayed out because we did not activate inventory, so we cannot add inventory items that we can track the quantity of. You may also notice if we click Reports, you can look through all the standard reports that you want to. You will not see any inventory specific reports that help you track the quantity of the items that you buy and sell. But after we activate the inventory quantities, when we come back to the standard section of reports, there will be a section of inventory reports that we will pin to the customize section and use. So how do you change the settings? Go again to the cog wheel, and after you click, go all the way to the left and click Account and Settings. If you have a different subscription, it might say Company Settings. Just double click. And now here are the different categories of account settings. And you can click the category and see the different settings available. We will click the Expense section and see that that's not the right one. We will click the sales section and after clicking the sales section scroll down to the area of products and services. Right now track inventory quantity on hand is off but you can click on the word off in, it in order to get the editing ability and then click in the box to add the check mark. 
Then we click Save, and it says Turning on Inventory will also show the Items table on Expenses and Purchase Forms, which we will deal with in later videos. After we click OK, you will notice the change. Close this. Now go back, or oh, give it a moment. Okay, now when we look at Reports, Standard, scroll down very slowly, we're looking for a specific report. Aha, notice there are now inventory related reports, and the most important one is this one inventory valuation detail double click and this is going to be our most important inventory report for tracking the quantities of the items that we buy and sell let's click the pull down and click all dates and then click run report now that it looks the way we want it to look we click save customization and then again save so now if we click reports and go to custom reports we will see our inventory valuation detail very easy to get to the other change you will notice is clicking this cog wheel and then if we go over again to the list of products and services now you will see that well first of all there's a little bit of different uh, logo here on the top but most importantly if you click new now you can see you have inventory available and you can make your inventory products on this list with this item type and that's how you would track the quantity. The only other change is in the plus sign for the new transaction list. You will notice they added this inventory activity, inventory quantity adjustment that wasn't there a moment ago but now that we activate an inventory it's there and we will definitely learn about that in a later video now we can add our inventory items and we make it very simple and clear for this course we buy and sell apples and we buy and sell bananas we buy the apples at ten dollars a crate and we sell the apples at fifty dollars a crate we buy the bananas at twenty dollars a crate and sell the bananas at a hundred dollars a crate and when we put them on the items list we will connect both of the items to the same three accounts and we will learn more about those three accounts in the video that follows this one but for now let's just finish the setup so where do we go we click the cog wheel and we go over to the list of products and services then again we click new now notice we have the ability to choose inventory double click now of course the first one will be apples I like to put it in capitals and we scroll down now notice you have additional accounts that we did not have before when we dealt with non inventory parts when we dealt with non inventory parts we had a sales income account that the item was connected to and this one came with QuickBooks so we'll use this one you had an expense account for cost of goods sold but you did not have this other account inventory asset this is an account in the chart of accounts that will represent the total money that you paid to purchase all of your products that are still here sitting in inventory so there's an extra account and these three accounts came with QuickBooks and we will use them so the first one is named apples and the uh, sales price is fifty dollars a crate and the purchase cost is ten dollars a crate and then we will click save and new now uh, the quantity on hand we will start off with zero because we have not yet purchased any so well let's click save and new 
Uh, and then the date. We have to put the date for the quantity. Boy, this is really stupid and annoying. So we had zero as of January 1 of 2020. Save and new. Okay. Now the next one is bananas. And as of January 1, 2020, we had zero. I guess that's better than nothing. We will use the same inventory asset account to reflect the cost of what we have on hand. We will use the same sales income account to reflect the money that the customers gave us when we sold the bananas and the same cost of goods sold account to track the cost of what we paid for the bananas that we give the customer. The sales price per crate is 100 and the purchase cost per crate of bananas is 20. Now we can click save and close. Uh, the date on hand, boy, that, that's really, uh, really annoying. I don't get it. The date of the quantity on hand is required. Okay, January 1, we had zero, save and close. Okay, good. So you have to be careful. It's a little annoying what they make you do. But now we have apples and bananas on our list. We can see it's an inventory type of item, and we can see only the sales price. And we would have to reopen it in order to get to the purchase cost. Chapter 5, Using Non-Inventory Parts. Non-inventory parts are items that you both purchase and sell just like regular inventory. They're items that you do not need to track the quantity of. You can track the purchase cost in an expense type of account when you buy the items, and you can track the sales income in an income type of account when you sell them. When you set them up on the list of products and services, you must choose the expense account for the purchase costs and the income account for the sales price. So, some examples of non-inventory parts would be contractors who use job supplies, even if they buy them and mark them up, they don't really count the supplies and keep an inventory, like the bricks they would use to repair a wall, or the wooden beams that they use to build a wall, and so on. What about a painter? A painter would not keep track of how many cans of paint they have and how many cans they specifically sold. They would simply buy it and then use it and then charge their customer, but they would not keep in their QuickBooks records the quantity purchased, sold, and that which remains. In our example, we will use fruit crates that hold the fruit that is sold to a customer. Because sometimes when companies sell, they give a little markup for the container that they sell it in, but they don't really keep track of how many they buy and how many they sell of that container, in this case crates. So, non-inventory parts are also called two-sided items. And they're called two-sided items because they have a purchase cost and a sales price that you have to set up when you set up the item. The purchase cost is what will automatically appear when you write a check to buy the items, when you record an expense type of transaction to buy the items, or you enter a vendor's bill when you buy the non-inventory part. The sales price will automatically show up on the invoice that you record when you sell the item, or the sales receipt when you sell the item will have the sales price if the customer pays immediately. Now our example of a non-inventory part will be fruit crates, the containers that we actually give when we sell the fruit. So we have to buy them and we have to charge a little markup to our customers for the crates but we don't actually count them and keep track of the quantity. So the fruit crate's purchase cost, when we write a check and we buy them, will go into an expense type of account. But when we sell the fruit crates, the income will go into an income of, uh, type of account, like sales.
So let's add those two accounts to the chart of accounts as part of the setup for buying and selling the non-inventory part. Go down to Accounting and click Chart of Accounts. Now this is the first time in this new account that we're looking at the chart of accounts so you get this little picture and you click see your chart of accounts. Notice QuickBooks Online already comes with a set of accounts in the chart of accounts and it is assumed that these are common accounts that we would use with any company. And now we will add the specific accounts that we need so in the top right we click new now the account type is expense and the detail type really doesn't matter so let's just choose uh, let's just choose other business expense now we know the name of it is fruit crate purchases cap locks and then we can click save and close but we really should click save and new because the next account will be an income type of account and the category for that could either be sales of product or service fee it doesn't really matter but we'll choose sales of product and we'll call it fruit crate sales and now we have an account to hold the income and the account to hold the purchase cost when we buy let's click save and new because we also need accounts receivable accounts payable and cash in order to pay to or from any of the things that we buy and sell in the course so let's leave the name account receivable and detail type account receivable and click save and new we should do the same thing for accounts payable and leave the detail type account payable and click save and new we also should add a bank type of account and maybe checking is the most common for our operating account when we buy and sell and we'll give it the name because ultimately the cash will come in for selling and out for buying even if it goes to receivables and payables first now we can click save and close and you can look carefully at your chart of accounts and you can see cash account receivable accounts payable you go down to the income section you can see you have an income account for fruit crate sales and go to the expense section and you can see you have fruit crate purchases right here as an expense now let's put this item on the items list of products and services in QuickBooks Online we will put five dollars each for the purchase cost and we will put twenty dollars each for the sales price so to add something to the list of products and services we go to the top right and we click the cog wheel then we go across to lists and click products and services now QuickBooks already comes with one uh, product and, or, or really two services but we won't use the ones that QuickBooks Online comes with we'll make our own and we'll click new and this is a non inventory part and the name of it is fruit crates I like to put capital now the income account associated with fruit crates is up here fruit crate sales the one we put on the list a moment ago now the sales price is twenty dollars each now in order to make this a two-sided item we have to click this box I purchased this product or service from a vendor now 
when we scroll down, you can see that you have the opportunity to put the expense account, in this case, fruit crate purchases, the one we just made, and what we normally buy each one for. Okay, you don't need preferred vendor, you can leave that blank. Now we click save and close, and we have our fruit crates on the list of products and services so we can record the purchase and we can record the sale. Now, here's the example purchase. Let's imagine on January 1 of 2020, we purchased 100 crates from Staples with check number one. Now, before we do that, let's click reports and go to the trial balance. You can see right now we have everything zero in the trial balance because we have not yet recorded any transactions in this new account. And now we will do the example purchase. Let's imagine on January 1 of 2020 we purchased 100 crates from Staples with check number one. Now we know that we're purchasing 100 and we remember the purchase cost is five dollars each. So in America a hundred times five equals five hundred and that should be the amount of check number one. But then the question is what will show up on the trial balance at the moment we record this check? Well fruit crate purchases which was the expense account that keeps track of the total that we paid when we bought the fruit crates, that will show up on the trial balance for the $500. And at the same moment, cash and bank will show a negative $500 because if our trial balance is starting with zero for everything, it means QuickBooks Online thinks we have zero dollars in cash and Chase Bank. So if we write a $500 check, it will show up as negative. And I put a negative number, but I really did not have to because people who know a little bit about accounting know that if cash, the balance of cash is on the credit side, on the right side, it's implied that it's negative. But anyway, it will look very similar to this after we record our first check purchasing the non-inventory part. From the top left, click New and go over to Vendors and click Check. Now the payee is the vendor staples. The date is January 1 of 2020. Now you have to look carefully at the bottom section of the check. You can close out the category details and click the triangle for item details and then click under the word product and service to get the items list. Right now we only have one item on the items list, fruit crates. And notice because this is a check, QuickBooks put the rate at five dollars each because that's the rate that we purchase the crates at and we set that up on the items list. The quantity is 100 and QuickBooks will calculate the quantity times the rate to tell you the amount of the check. So cash will become negative for $500 and we will have $500 in the expense for purchasing the fruit crates. Click save and close and if we go click to reports, tri trial balance, you can see that the numbers are exactly as what we expected. This expense, fruit crate purchases, showed up as $500 and cash and bank is showing a negative $500 because it is on the credit side. But don't worry, it won't be too negative for long because now I will show you the example sale. Let's imagine on January 2nd of 2020 we sold 10 crates to Allen who deposited the money from the sale directly into our bank account. Now 
We know that we're selling 10, and we know we sell them for $20 each. So in America, 10 times 20 equals 200. So if that's the amount of the sale, it means the income account, fruit crate sales, will show up for the first time as 200, and cash and bank will be 200 less negative, and will only owe the bank 300 because Alan was kind enough to deposit 200 into our account. Let's take a look at how to record it. Since we got paid immediately, we will make a sales receipt. In the top left, click New, and in the column of Customers, click Sale Receipt. Now, the date is January 2nd. The customer is Alan. By the way, your sale receipt will say number one. I was just playing around. You could fix it. You do not have to agree with the default number that QuickBooks gives you. You can type in your own on the right here, but I'm just going to fix it. Okay, so we have sale receipt number 1001. The customer is Alan, and the date is January 2nd. Now we will choose which product or service. When we click this arrow, this is our items list. And this is the item we set up. And we click Fruit Crates. And the quantity that we're selling is 10. So QuickBooks remembers when we set up the item list that the rate for each one, the sales rate, was $20 each. And that's why Alan deposited this money directly into our Cash and Chase Bank for this sale receipt. Now when we click Save and Close, the numbers are exactly as what we expected. Fruit Crate sales showed up for the first time as 300 and because Alan put 200 in our bank, the balance of the bank is less negative. It's still on the credit side, which means it's a negative bank balance, but it's 200 less negative. Now the most important report to look at is right here. Reports, profit and loss. And you can see we have $200 in income from the sales, and we have $500 for the expense that we paid to buy them. So we currently have a loss of 300 And that brings us to our next major point. The profit and loss report will not show the real profit from buying and selling non-inventory parts. That's because the expense account, in this case, crate purchases, includes all the crates that we purchased, including the ones that we still have. This is because non-inventory parts do not consider quantity. And that's why we really need to activate inventory so that only the quantity sold will be deducted to find the profit. You see, right now we have the wrong profit. We have minus 300, and that's wrong. But we know that the correct profit is positive 150. Wait a minute. Why is the correct profit a positive 150? Because we know we got $200 for selling 10 of them, but we also know that we paid $50 for each of the 10 well, for, for the 10 crates that went out, we paid 50 and we got 200. So that's how we know the real profit is 150. That means there's literally a $450 difference between the wrong profit and the correct profit. How do you account for that? Well, if you've been following the story, you know that we still have 90 crates with us that we have not yet sold. The computer doesn't know that because we did not activate inventory and count the quantity. So if you consider the 90 that we still have times the $5 that we paid for each of those, that means we still have $450 as a value that the computer doesn't know that we still have.
And that explains why there's a $450 difference between what the computer says we have as profit and what we really have as profit. So that's why you must activate inventory and consider quantity. Now stick around because the video that follows this one, we will show you how to activate inventory. Chapter 6, Purchasing Inventory for Cash. We pay vendors immediately for merchandise that we receive today. We can write a check if that's what we're giving them, or if we pay online, we can use the expense type of transaction that QuickBooks Online makes available. The result will be the same. Our cash will be negative temporarily until we start selling. So just for illustrative educational purposes, just imagine we have a line of credit with the bank and we will owe them in our bank account until we start selling. That will help you understand the numbers a little bit better. So what happens in our QuickBooks records at the moment that we purchase inventory and pay for the inventory immediately? Well, the cash in the bank goes down and in our case will become more negative and the inventory asset that we discussed in a prior video will increase. That inventory asset represents the total money that we paid for all of the merchandise that we currently have. For example, let's imagine on January 2nd of 2020 we paid Addie's Orchard with check number two to buy a hundred apples that we received today. Can you guess the check amount? Well, if you remember that we buy them for $10 each because that's how we set it up in the items list in the previous video, then $10 each and we buy a hundred means we're paying Addy a thousand dollars to buy inventory. Now, this is what the trial balance looks like before we record this check. But if we pay a thousand dollars to purchase inventory that we still have, it means a thousand dollars will show up as the balance of the inventory asset. And if we paid from cash and bank and we already have a negative three hundred, that means cash and bank will become more negative and it will become 1300 on the credit side. And this is what the trial balance should look like after we write our check for our first merchandise purchase. From the top left we click New, go over to where it says Vendors and click Check. And here we are writing check number two, the date we're writing the check is January 2nd of 2020. The payee is Addie's Orchard. Now, you have to be careful down here. You probably see category details and you probably don't notice item details. You have to click the triangle up to remove category details because we're not paying an expense and click the triangle where it says item details because we're buying something that's on the products and service lists. So after you open item details, click directly under the word product service to bring the pull down arrow. Now choose apples. Notice QuickBooks remembers that the rate per apple is $10 each and we're buying 100. That means we're writing a check to Addie's Orchard for $1,000 and we have $1,000 worth of inventory in our warehouse and in our records. Now when we click Save and Close, the numbers on the trial balance are exactly as what we predicted in advance. We have $1,000 worth of inventory and a debt to the bank of $1,300. But there is another place to check the results. If we click reports and we click inventory valuation detail, you can see that the reason why 
we have a thousand dollars in the inventory asset is because we have a hundred apples that we pay ten dollars each and if the cost is a thousand that means the asset value is a thousand so this report explains the details of the inventory asset account in the trial balance and now let's let's imagine on January 3rd we paid Sam's farm with an online transfer for a hundred bananas that we received today can you guess the amount it's not really a check it's an online payment but can you guess the amount that's correct that would be two thousand dollars because we buy them for twenty dollars each and we're paying for a hundred of them so the amount we're giving is two thousand so what will be the result in the trial balance after we pay this two thousand well cash will become very negative three thousand three hundred but inventory asset will increase from one thousand to three thousand because if we pay two thousand more to buy two thousand more worth of inventory that means the account increases by two thousand and we will now have three thousand dollars worth of inventory sitting here in our warehouse available for sale so if we're not writing a check we click new and if it's an online transfer we click expense now you may notice let's close this you may notice the expense window is the same as the check window we're paying Sam's farm remember we're not buying uh, we're not paying for services or expenses you have to click item details the date by the way is January 3rd that we're actually paying and in the reference number field you should put the number that the bank or the uh, company gave you as the transaction number so you can trace it back later to the statement but it's the same idea as check number if you're paying online now click directly under product and service and this time choose bananas QuickBooks remembers we buy them at twenty dollars each because that's how we set them up in the items list and if we are buying a hundred of them that means oh, excuse me only a hundred that means we're paying Sam's farm with an online transfer of two thousand dollars to buy two thousand dollars more worth of inventory click save and close and now the numbers are exactly as what we expected we now paid a total of three thousand dollars for inventory and we now owe a lot of money to our bank but you may well ask why do we have three thousand dollars in the inventory asset the answer is in the report called inventory valuation detail double click and you will see go to the right a little bit if we have a thousand dollars worth of apples and now we also have two thousand dollars worth of bananas that means the total asset value here is one thousand plus two thousand that means we have three thousand dollars of inventory available for sale and that's the reason why inventory asset says three thousand dollars chapter seven making credit purchases when you purchase merchandise on account it means you pay vendors for the merchandise after you receive it the accounts payable reports will show how much you owe the vendor for the merchandise until the vendor is paid inventory quantity will increase the same way it will increase if you paid cash for the merchandise because you still physically have it with you so what happens when you purchase inventory on account well we know the inventory asset must increase because you physically have more inventory but instead of paying cash accounts payable will increase and accounts payable increases because that's the account that represents how much money you owe the vendors for merchandise that you bought and will pay for later 
For example, let's imagine on January 4th of 2020, we received 50 apples from Addie's Orchard with bill number 8472. She sent a bill because we received the apples without paying for them. Can you guess the bill amount? Well, we know we purchase apples at $10 each and we're buying 50 of them, so the bill amount is 500. So if we received $500 of merchandise that we did not yet pay for, what would happen in the trial balance? Well, the inventory asset would increase by $500 because we have $500 more of merchandise. And accounts payable would show up for the first time on the trial balance in the amount of $500. So let's go ahead and record this bill now. In the top left, we click New, go to the column of vendors, and click Bill. Now the date, if I'm not mistaken, was January 4th. And we bought this from Addie's Orchard. And the bill number is 8472 for all you Star Trek fans out there. Now remember, you have to scroll down and close up the category details and click the triangle next to item details. Then click directly under the products and services. Click the pull down arrow and choose apples. QuickBooks remembers we purchased them for $10 each and we are buying 50 of them so that means the bill amount is 500. That's all you have to do if you receive the items with a bill. Then click Save and Close, and you can see the results on the trial balance are exactly as what we expected. Accounts payable is 500, and inventory asset is 500. We can also look at the report that we set up in an earlier video, Transaction List by Vendor, by clicking Reports, Custom Reports, Transaction List by Vendor, and you can see all of the transactions for each vendor. Here's Addy, this is check number two, and this is bill number 8472. Now, please note, there are other reports that help you manage your vendor relationship. The unpaid bills report will show the remaining balance. Let's set that up. Reports, go to standard reports, scroll down slowly to the section of who you owe money to, what you owe, and the most important report in the what you owe section in the standard reports would be unpaid bills. And notice it already says all dates and we only owe Addie's Orchard for that one bill. But let's go ahead and click Save Customization and click Save so that we can refer back to this when buying merchandise on account and knowing what we owe. Now the last point is if you need to learn more about vendors balance you can study about vendors and payables right here on this website. But the last thing I want to show you is if you click Reports and click Custom Reports and go back to the Inventory Valuation Detail, you can see that the quantity of apples has increased by 50 and the money amount of apples has increased to 1500 because of this bill, the bill we received with the merchandise on January 4th. Chapter 8, The Perpetual Inventory System. We have already learned how to record an income from a service. It's just one T account that represents the total money that came in from what we earned. In previous cases, it was just one number, the service fee, and it represented the price of the service. So you previously made a credit to this income account for exactly what the customer gave you. 
However, when we have merchandise that we're selling, we still have an income account that represents the total money that came in from the customer for merchandise sales. But in a case of a merchandise company, we're not dealing with one number in the income section, we're really dealing with three numbers. The sales price of the merchandise, which will get recorded as a credit to this income account, the same way the income from a service got recorded to the service income account. But with merchandise, we also have to consider how much did the merchandise cost you when you bought it. Because the difference between the price that you record as income and the cost that you pay for the merchandise will be your profit. Now, the most important words in this video are the words cost and the words price. And you have to make sure you know the difference between the word cost and the word price. Cost means the amount that we paid to purchase the merchandise from the vendor. But for that very same merchandise, the word price means the amount we received from the customer when selling the merchandise. And of course, the difference is your profit. Price minus cost equals profit, and we all know that, but only if the goods are sold. So we therefore have to clarify our definition. We should really say the price of the goods that were sold minus the purchase cost of the goods that were sold is what really equals our profit. The price of the goods that are sold is the value that the customer gives us. The cost of the goods that are sold is the value of what we gave to the customer. It's what we paid for the goods that went out. The word perpetual means continuously changing. That means if we're using the perpetual inventory method to record the sale, the account inventory asset changes after each transaction. That means it changes after we buy the merchandise and it also changes after we sell the merchandise. Now, of course, in the top right here, we have our sales income account. This is very similar to the service income account that we were using in previous videos. You record a credit for what the customer gives you, because that's the income that you earned. So previously, we made a credit for the price of the service when the customer paid us, or when we earned the service income. So now, when we deliver the goods, we make a credit to sales income for the price of the goods that are sold, because that's the income that we earned, and that's a T-account just like service income. However, the interesting stuff happens down here in the cost of goods sold account. This is not technically an expense even though it behaves like an expense, and even though it has the same effect on income. It would go in the income section as a contra income account, not an expense account, because it's part of the income cycle. You have to buy, then sell. Then you can subtract your expenses to find your net income. So that explains a little bit about this new account in the bottom right, cost of goods sold. And now let's see how to use these accounts when we purchase and sell merchandise. First, let's give cash a beginning balance. That's not a transaction. We're just pretending that we're starting off with $10,000 cash. Now here's our first transaction. Pay $300 to purchase merchandise. Well, we know if we pay, cash is minus cash is credit. And just like purchasing any other asset, exactly what we paid for the asset becomes a debit to that asset for that date. So this purchase transaction is no different than the ones we've learned before when we purchased other assets. 
But the interesting part comes here. When we sell with perpetual, we record it twice, once for the cost and once for the price. Now that's a lovely little rhyme, so let's say it again. When we sell with perpetual, we record it twice, once for the cost and once for the price. Let's take a look at an example. Let's imagine on January 8, we sold the specific merchandise that we purchased on January 1, but we sold them for $1,200. So you can see this is the merchandise that we purchased back on January 1. This is the merchandise sitting here waiting to be sold. Now if we sold it for $1,200, it means that the customer gave us $1,200, and it also means we've earned $1,200 worth of income for selling the merchandise. So what would be the debits and the credits? Well, if we've earned $1,200 worth of income for sales, and we know that income is credit, on January 8th, we would have to credit the sales income account for the $1,200 that we earned. On the other hand, the customer gave us $1,200, so we have no choice but to debit cash on January 8th for the $1,200. So this first debit and credit looks just like it looked when we sold the service. Credit the income and debit the cash. However, there is now an extra step for this same January 8th sale. For this January 8th sale, we also have to credit inventory because this $300 of inventory is no longer here. It went out. So we have to remove it from inventory by making a credit of 300 So then what would we debit 300 And obviously the answer is cost of goods sold. Credit inventory for the merchandise that went out and debit cost of goods sold for the purchase cost of the specific merchandise that we gave to the customer. Can you guess the profit from this particular sale? Of course, the profit is $900. Anybody could figure that out because it was only one sale. Watch another one. Let's imagine on January 20, we purchased $500 more of inventory. Again, that's the easy one. We have 500 more of this asset, and on the other hand, we have 500 less of cash. So we know purchasing under the perpetual system is very easy. Debit the inventory that you got and credit the cash. Now again, the interesting part is when you actually sell. Let's imagine on January 31, we sold the specific merchandise that we previously purchased on January 20, and we sold it for $3,300. Well, here's the merchandise that we purchased back on January 20, so we know that has to come out of inventory. But what should we do first? Well, we've actually earned $3,300 by receiving that from the customer for giving them the merchandise. So always income is credit for what we earned. And if the customer gave us 3300 in cash, we have to debit cash. So the debit and the credit for the price of the January 31 sale is credit sales income and debit cash. But we're not finished. This specific $500 of inventory went out on January 31. So we credit inventory 500, then what do we debit 500? Well, $500 was the purchase cost of the goods that we gave the customer on January 31, the specific goods. So here we have the debit and the credit for the cost. So we have four accounts changing when we make a sale. Credit sales income and debit cash for the price and the income we earned. 
credit inventory for the cost of the goods that are sold and debit cost of goods sold. Now, obviously, at the end of the month or the end of the period, we would get the total of the sales income and the total of the cost of goods sold, and we would eventually put them together to find the profit from our merchandise operation. In this case, the profit is 3700 But when you're an accountant, you're not finished when you calculate the profit. The profit is the result of the income section of our operation. We then have to subtract out all the other expenses that we learned about in previous videos to get the final number, the net income. In fact, sales income and cost of goods sold are together in the income section of the income statement, and the expenses are at the bottom. They're both in the income section because both buying and selling are part of the revenue cycle. And if you have a merchandise business, the gross profit is the result of the income section. You then simply record all your other expenses and subtract them the way you did when you had a service business to find your final net income. Chapter 9. Cash Sales of Inventory When customers pay immediately for products we sell them, the correct document to give them is a sales receipt. Selling items makes the quantity decrease and decreases the inventory asset for the purchase cost of the goods that were given to the customer. It increases the sales income account for the amount that the customers pay. For example, let's imagine on January 5th of 2020, we sold 20 apples cash today to Allen. All cash sales are directly deposited into the bank account at the moment we make the sale. So what would the price of the sale be? Well, 20 apples that we sell at $50 each means that Alan has to give us $1,000. And what did we pay for the apples that we just gave to Alan? Well, $10 each for 20 apples means the cost of the apples that were sold is $200. Now, this is what the trial balance looks like before that sale. But if we earned $1,000 in sales income, that means that sales will show up for the first time as $1,000. And because the cost of the goods that were sold in that sale were $200, for that very same sale receipt, cost of goods sold will show up in the trial balance for the first time as $200. And because we gave $200 worth of merchandise, or merchandise that we paid $200 for, since that went out, that means that inventory asset will decrease by $200 and become $3,200. And of course, because Alan gave us $1,000 cash, we have $1,000 less negative in our balance, and it goes down from $3,300 negative to 2,300 negative. And these will be the numbers in the trial balance after we record this sale. We go to the top left and click New, and we go down to Sales Receipt. The date is January 5th of 2020. The customer is Alan Arby. Now, the product or service in this case is apples, and we are selling 20 of them, and that means he has to pay us $1,000. Now, this is really sale receipt, no, well, leave it as sale receipt number three, it doesn't really matter, and notice the money is deposited, di deposited directly into the Cash and Chase Bank. So it's very easy to fill out a sale receipt when you get paid immediately for merchandise that you're selling. When we click Save and Close, you can see 
that the numbers in the trial balance are exactly as what we expected and exactly as what we predicted at the moment that we recorded this sale receipt cost of goods sold 200 sales or the the sales product income a thousand and then of course inventory asset went down to three thousand three hundred now let's understand why inventory asset is three thousand three hundred click reports then click inventory valuation detail and you can see at the bottom of the Apple section this January 5th sale receipt decreased the quantity of apples from 50 on hand uh, decreased by 20 uh, by 20 and that's why the cost of the sale was 200 and now we only have 130 apples left in inventory let's take a look at the next example let's imagine on January 6th 2020 we sold 20 bananas cash today to Betty well all cash sales are directly deposited the price of this sale can you guess well it's 20 bananas and we sell them for a hundred dollars each so that's two thousand dollars and what's the cost of this sale well we bought the bananas for twenty dollars each and we're selling twenty of them so that's four hundred dollars and those will be the numbers that change the trial balance when we record that sale okay so that's January 6th bananas to Betty so we click in the top well click in the top left sale receipt January 6th Betty the product is bananas and we're selling 20 that means she has to give us two thousand dollars after we click save and close we should click reports trial balance and you can see that sales has increased to three thousand and cost of goods sold has increased to six hundred let's go over to the three thousand and double click and you can see both sales have been recorded in the sales income account sales of product income and you can see the first sale made it show up for a thousand and then this second sale receipt on this second line here you can see the January 6th sale receipt to Betty you can see increased the sales income by 2000 because that was the amount of sales income we earned and that's why it's three thousand dollars if you click reports and go back to the trial balance and click on the 600 for cost of goods sold you can see oops, excuse me reports trial balance make sure you click on the 600 for cost of goods sold you can see the very same sales receipts are recorded in cost of goods sold for the same dates and same customers but if it's in the cost of goods sold account it's showing the amount that we paid for the items not the amount the customer paid because we're looking at these sale receipts in cost of goods sold so the second sale receipt increased the cost of goods sold by 400 click reports click trial balance so if cost of goods sold went up by 400 that means inventory asset decreased by 400 for the amount of this sale double click now you can see if you double click inventory the number and go down to the very last transaction in the inventory account January 6th the sale to Betty has decreased the inventory account by four hundred dollars because that was the cost of goods sold so now the balance of the inventory account is twenty nine hundred and if you want to know the details of the balance of the inventory account you click reports you click inventory valuation detail now look at the bananas you can see that this sale receipt on January 6th decreased the quantity of bananas by 20 and therefore decreased the value by 400 so we now have remaining $1,300 dollars 
worth of apples because we have 130 apples. We have 80 bananas left that we paid 1600 for. And when you add up the purchase cost of apples plus bananas, that's what explains in the trial balance the inventory asset balance of 2900 Chapter 10, Inventory Sales on Account. When a customer pays after they receive the merchandise, you're selling items that make the quantity decrease and decreases the inventory asset for the purchase cost of the goods given to the customer. It still increases the sales income for the amount that the customers will pay you in the future. It also increases the account called account receivable that represents the balance of all customers and what they owe you. And the proper document to create when selling on account is an invoice. For example, let's imagine on January 6th, we sold 10 apples on account to customer Candy. Candy's balance will appear on the open invoice report. Now, do you know the price of the sale that Candy will pay in the future? Well, if it's 10 apples, and if you remember, we sell for $50 each, that means the price that Candy will pay in the future is 500 do you know what it cost us to sell those 10 apples? Well, if we bought them for $10 each, that means we paid $100 for the apples that we gave to Candy. So if your trial balance looks like this before that sale, what will it look like after the sale? Well, sales of product income will increase by what the customer will give us. And if she gives us 500, sales of product income will increase to $3,500. And what will cost of goods sold become? Well, we paid $100 for the apples that we just gave to Candy. So cost of goods sold will increase by $100 and become $700. And if cost of goods sold increases by what we paid, that means inventory asset will decrease by what we paid for the apples we just gave. So if we have $100 fewer in apples in the inventory account, inventory asset will become $2,800. And because this is our very first invoice, accounts receivable will show up for the first time and it will show up in the money amount that is owed to us for this sale, $500. So these are what the numbers will be after we record our first invoice sale for merchandise on account. In the top left, click New. Then go down and click Invoice. Okay, it's our first invoice so we can close out the help now we put the date January 6th and we choose the customer candy we click directly under where it says product and service and choose apples now we know that we're selling 10 apples and QuickBooks remembers they're fifty dollars each the way we put them on the list so the amount that the customer has to pay in the future is the amount of the sale, $500. Let's click Save and Close. And now when we go back to Reports, Trial Balance, you can see the numbers are exactly as what we predicted. Sales went up to $3,500. Cost of goods sold went up to $700. Inventory asset went down to 2800 and accounts receivable went up to 500 for the very first time. If you want to see why inventory asset decreased, you can click Reports, and you can click Inventory Valuation Detail, and you can see that this invoice for January 6th decreased the quantity of apples by 10 
thereby decreasing the cost of apples to 1200 which means the cost of overall inventory decreased to the amount that it says 2800 that's showing in the trial balance you should also check the customer records because you have account receivable if you click reports we already have on the list transaction list by customer and you can see that candy shows up for the first time because this is basically a list of every transaction for every customer so this will show up on the list and you could double click the invoice and change anything you want and all the numbers will correct themselves in reports but you should also add the open invoice report to your list of accounts click report or list of reports click reports standard now we want to go down to the area of who owes you because the most important report when dealing with who owes you is the open invoice report click open invoice now we only have candy's invoice because she's the only one that we made an invoice for she's the only one who owes us money click the pull down and choose all dates run report and now we can use this going forward so click save customization and then click save so now you have two reports that help you manage your relationship with your customers the transaction list by customer just a list of every transaction but this report will show you who owes and for what and that will be important in the coming videos chapter 11 refund receipts from sales when customers return merchandise the effect on the accounts is the opposite of the sale the quantity of the items returned will increase because we just got back more items from the customer the correct document to create when merchandise is returned from a cash sale is called a refund receipt so what happens when items are returned for cash well the cash and bank will go down because we just gave back some of our cash to the customer for the returned items and the sales income will decrease by the sales price of the item because those items were never really sold if the customer turned around and gave it back to us consequently the cost of goods sold will also decrease by the amount that we paid when we bought the items for resale because we just got them back so they weren't sold so cost of goods sold goes down the only thing that increases is the inventory asset and the inventory asset will increase because we just received back items that were sold so if we now receive back items from a customer we have more available for sale in inventory for example let's imagine on January 7th Alan returned two apples from the January 3rd sale receipt what would be the price of the items returned or the sales price well we sell the apples for fifty dollars each so a hundred dollars of the sale of the apple is what's reversed and then what did we pay for the two apples that were returned well we buy them for ten dollars each so we paid twenty dollars for the two apples that were returned so what will be the result of this sale return in the trial balance well we have a hundred dollars less in sales so sales will decrease to thirty four hundred we have twenty dollars less in cost of goods sold so cost of goods sold decreases to six hundred eighty and inventory actually has twenty dollars more because we just received back merchandise so that will become 2820 and unfortunately because we had to pay them back a hundred dollars our negative balance becomes a hundred dollars more negative and goes down to 400 credit so these will be the numbers in the trial balance after we record our refund receipt and 
here's the example refund you must make sure that you put the exact same items on the refund receipt apples that you originally put on the original sale receipt so January 7th two apples returned from Allen in the top left click new and go down below sale receipt to where it says refund receipt the date is January 7th the customer returning is Allen now the item that is being returned are apples and we are returning two of them so the amount we must refund and where it says refund from you have to choose which bank or credit card account you're refunding the money from so that's how you fill out a refund receipt and then when you click save and close you uh, okay you successfully issued a refund to Allen it means that you physically wrote him a check from your handwritten checkbook and you gave it to him now click OK and notice the results are exactly as what we expected 3400 sales of product cost of goods sold 680 inventory asset 2820 and cash and bank decreased to more negative 400 just to double check click reports inventory valuation detail and you can see when you go down to the bottom of apples it says January 7th was a refund that increased the quantity by two apples and increased the cost to 1220 just for apples chapter 12 credit returns of inventory when a customer returns merchandise the effect on the account is the opposite of the sale the quantity of the items returned will increase because you're getting back more items from the customer the correct document to create when merchandise is returned from an invoice is a credit memo so what happens when you return items for credit well sales income will decrease by the sales price of the items returned and of course cost of goods sold will decrease by the purchase cost what you paid for the returned items inventory asset will increase because you actually have more inventory available for sale because customers just gave you inventory and because they're returning it for credit accounts receivable the account that represents what all customers owe will decrease they will owe you less because they return the item for credit for example let's imagine on January 8th candy returned two bananas from the January 6th invoice you must make sure that you put the same items on the credit memo that you put on the original invoice so if this is the transaction what would be the price of the return well we sell bananas for a hundred dollars each so 200 would be the amount of income that we are reversing and what would be the cost of the return well we pay twenty dollars for each of those two bananas so the amount that reverses in cost of goods sold as well as inventory would be forty dollars so let's go ahead and record this credit memo we click new and scroll down to the left column where it says credit memo the date would be January 8th of 2020 the customer would be candy now the product or service would be bananas and we're only returning two of them so that means we're unearning we're reversing the two hundred dollars of income earned as we click save and close now if you click reports trial balance you can see that the sales 
income went down and if you double click the number and scroll down to the very last transaction that was recorded in sales income you can see January 8th the credit memo that we made for candy scroll to the right decreased the income by 200 because we no longer have income for those two bananas because we didn't sell them if we click reports trial balance and go to the cost of goods sold and double click you can scroll down to the very last transaction in cost of goods sold and see that this credit memo scroll to the right lowered the cost of goods sold to 640 because we didn't sell these two bananas so we don't have the forty dollars in cost of goods sold click reports if you go back to the trial balance you can see that the inventory asset has decreased by forty dollars if you double click you can scroll down and you can see that the very last transaction recorded in the inventory asset was january eighth this credit memo and you can see that it increased inventory by forty dollars making the total of inventory asset twenty eight sixty and you can confirm that by clicking reports inventory valuation detail and if you scroll to the bottom of the section of bananas you can see this credit memo actually increased the quantity by two because the customer gave us back two. Now the value of apples plus the value of bananas equals the amount that we just saw in the inventory asset account in the trial balance. And what you must also do is check the open invoice report because even though our focus in this course is managing inventory we should know a little bit about adjusting the customer's balance so let's click reports open invoice and you can see for candy the net amount that she owes is 300 in other words QuickBooks automatically applied the two hundred dollar credit memo to the five hundred dollar invoice now if you open up this invoice by double clicking you will see the original amount was 500 that we recently recorded in this invoice in the prior video but the balance due is only 300 because QuickBooks Online just applied the two hundred dollar credit that we just made directly to this invoice so what went on well it used to be that you needed to do one more step after you created a credit memo you used to have to apply the credit memo to the invoice by making something called a zero dollar payment so now QuickBooks does that for you now let me explain clearly what just happened QuickBooks Online has a new feature as of May 2020. This new feature links the credit memo you just made to the existing invoices automatically. They do this by, behind the scenes, making what's called a zero dollar payment. That's what you would have had to do before they added this feature and you will see this zero dollar payment that they made in the transaction list by customer so let's click reports and click transaction list by customer and scroll all the way down I'm even gonna come over here now here's the invoice that we made for candy and here's the credit memo that we just recorded the invoice is dated January 6 the credit memo is properly dated January 8th but what's this this line here is what QuickBooks Online did behind the scenes just to be able to apply this credit memo to this particular invoice this is something called a zero dollar payment it's a payment that QuickBooks records 
for zero dollars because the function of this uh, payment connects and links the credit memo that you just made to the invoice. And notice the date is May 18th, not January 8th. And that's because I'm recording this video on May 18th of 2020. And QuickBooks created this, so QuickBooks put whatever today's date is, because it's their computers over there on the internet. I had no control over them creating this payment. Now, if you want to see what they did, you can double click and you can see that this is simply the same receive payment window that you learned about to record receiving payments from invoices. But the amount is zero because all they did was connect this credit memo to this invoice by clicking the check marks. By clicking the check marks for, uh, and then changing the, um, you know, they changed the amount to 200 so that you can see the credit memo is checked off as 200 applied and the invoice is checked off as being decreased by 200 and the amount received is zero. So this is what QuickBooks Online, it's a transaction for zero dollars that simply serves the function of applying this credit to this invoice. And you would have to do this in the days before, the, uh, before QuickBooks Online did this for you. But the net result, let's leave without saving, the net result is that this 200 is applied to this 500 and that's why the open invoice report shows only the net amount. Now, please note something very important. If the credit is not applied to the one you want, then you must reapply it yourself. That means you must open up the zero dollar payment and reapply the credit memo to the correct invoice. So we would have to go back to reports, transaction list by customer, scroll down and this one that's created by QuickBooks Online, we would have to double click and move the check mark to a different invoice and make sure the amount stays zero. Now, all I'm going to do is change the date. The date in real life, which is the date QuickBooks recorded the zero dollar payment, I'm going to change it to the date of the credit memo. And I highly recommend that you change the date of the receive payment that applies the credit memo to the same date as the credit memo. So I'm going to click save and new. Are you sure? Yes. And now when we go back to the transaction list by customer, it looks a little more consistent. It looks like the date uh, that we applied the credit memo is the same as the credit memo. Now, of course, I would not want to get too sidetracked about receivable issues in an inventory course, but I think it's important to mention. Chapter 13, Credit Purchase Return. When we return items to vendors that have been billed, the effect on the accounts is the opposite of entering the original bill from the purchase. The document that you make when returning items that were billed on account is called a vendor credit. Then you must apply the vendor credit to the original vendor's bill. So what happens in the accounts when we return items that we purchased for credit? Well, obviously inventory asset goes down for the amount that we paid for the items because if we're physically giving back items to the vendor we have less inventory and because the vendor's balance is reflected in accounts payable we owe the vendor less money if we return some of the items so both inventory asset and accounts payable will decrease for the purchase cost of the items that were returned. For example, let's imagine on January 9th 
we return three apples to Addie's Orchard from the January 4th bill, number 8472. So let's just go ahead and make a vendor credit for that. It's very simple. We click New in the top left, go to the column of Vendors, and go down to where it says Vendor Credit. Now filling out the vendor credit is the same as filling out the bill. We put the date of the return, we choose the specific vendor, so that's January 9th for the date, and Addie's Orchard for the vendor. Now remember, we're not dealing with expense categories, so you can click this triangle and collapse this. We're dealing with items. So click the triangle to open the items section. Then under where it says products and service, click here and choose apples. And we are returning three. And since we paid $10 each for the apples we're returning, QuickBooks knows the amount of this vendor credit is $30. We click Save and Close. And now when we click Reports and we go to the Trial Balance, you can see that inventory asset, if you double click inventory asset and go to the bottom, the very last transaction in inventory asset was January 9th. It was a vendor credit in the amount of $30 lowering the inventory asset. Click reports, go back to trial balance, and you can see accounts payable has also decreased from 500 to 470 and you could open that up and see here was the original bill for the 500 and here's the vendor credit lowering it to 470 now let's click reports inventory valuation detail and you can see for apples at the bottom section of apples we have three fewer apples as a result of this vendor credit lowering the money amount and quantity that we have of apples. Now you also have to check the unpaid bills report. Click reports, unpaid bills. Now I don't want to get too sidetracked into the accounts payable section, but basically this is the bill and this is the vendor credit. Now the unpaid bills report should not really show both the bill and the vendor credit. It should put them together and show you one remaining amount of 470 for that bill. What you have to make is what's called a zero dollar bill payment just to be able to apply this credit to this bill. Now this is something you learn more deeply in the accounts payable course but I just want to show you because it is part of inventory. You really should apply the vendor credit for merchandise to the bill for the merchandise. So we will make a bill payment on January 9th. The amount will be zero. We will simply apply these two together to make the unpaid bills report look the way it needs to look. Click New, go to Vendors, and click Pay Bills. Now, make sure it says January 9th, the day that you actually made the credit and on the day okay so we already have Addie's Orchard up here because that's the only unpaid bill we have and it's a little unusual how you apply the credit you have to click here and then you have to apply the credit uh, here notice it already knows that there's thirty dollars of credit available for Addie's Orchard so as soon as you do that as soon as you click this bill it will apply the credit but be careful when it applies the credit it assumes you're paying the rest of the bill and we are not yet paying the rest of the bill so please change the payment amount to zero and make it so that all it does is apply the credit to the bill save and close and now the unpaid bill report looks the way it should. 500 was the bill, but the open balance now, unpaid, is only 470. Chapter 14, Cash 
purchase returns. When we return items to vendors that you paid cash for, the effect on the accounts is the opposite of entering the original check or expense from the purchase. Even though this is a return for merchandise paid for with a check or expense, the document that you make when returning items that were paid for by a check or expense is still a vendor credit. Then, after you record the vendor credit, you must record depositing the vendor's refund check. After depositing the vendor's refund check, you must apply the vendor credit to the deposit with a zero dollar payment. So what happens when you return items that you want a refund for? Well, obviously inventory asset decreases because you just gave back merchandise to the vendor and cash in bank should increase because your vendor gave you a refund check for the money that you paid for the items that were just returned. For example, let's imagine on January 11th we return two bananas to Sam's Farm for the January 3rd expense transfer number 6161. Let's just record that vendor credit. In the top left click new, go over to vendor credit in the vendor column. The date is January 11th. The vendor you're returning to is Sam's Farm. Now, what are you returning? Remember, don't click category, click items. Click under the products and service and we're returning bananas. How many bananas are we returning? We're returning two bananas. Two crates of bananas that we originally paid $20 each for. So now there's a $40 credit here in the account for Sam's Farm, even though we paid him right away. Save and close. Now what do we have to do? The very next day, let's imagine, we deposited the refund check from Sam. He gave us a $40 check for the $40 that we just returned. So how do you record that? Go to the top left and click New, and go all the way over to Other and click Bank Deposit. And this bank deposit happened on the 12th of January, and it was deposited into Chase Bank. You must click under the word Received From and choose the vendor, Sam's Farm. That's very important. Now, here's the interesting part. Even though you paid immediately to Sam, the account that you will choose in this bank deposit, believe it or not, is accounts payable. Accounts payable. Because you're depositing money that you received from a vendor. And the money amount that you're depositing is $40. So again, you must choose accounts payable even if you originally purchased this for cash because you had to make a credit memo to handle the return. Now, click Save and Close. Now let's check the results. If you click Reports and you click Unpaid Bills, you will see that for Sam's Farm, you had a vendor credit that you had to make and you have to make the vendor credit because that's the only way to decrease the quantity of inventory. But what will cancel out that vendor credit is the deposit that you record when you bring the money from the vendor to the bank. Now all you have to do is one more step. Must apply the vendor credit to the bill payment with a zero dollar uh, bill payment. So neither of these should be on the unpaid bill reports at all. You have to apply them together so they don't show anything pending or unpaid. They both disappear. Let's make the zero dollar payment, uh, the zero dollar bill payment. Click new and go down to pay bills. Now the date, this is the important part, the date should be the date 
that you actually deposited the money into the bank. Was that the 12th or the 13th? I guess we'll find out. It was the 12th. So you make the deposit the day that you uh, sent the, you know, recorded the vendor credit and deposited the check. Now, when you click Sam's Farm, QuickBooks knows that you have a $40 credit to apply to the $40 deposit. So what this is here in this line, this is not a bill. With Addy, this is a bill. But with Sam, it has the result of the bill, but it's actually showing the $40 bank deposit. And when you click the check, it shows that you had $40 of credit available. Now all you have to do is click Save and Close, and it will wipe out Sam completely from the unpaid bill report. And that's because he should not be there because you don't have anything open or pending. So those are the steps to record refunding uh, uh, merchandise that you returned when you paid cash. One last point. Click Reports, Inventory Valuation. You can see that the vendor credit we made on the 11th decreased the quantity of bananas by two on January 11th, the day we gave the bananas back to Sam. Chapter 15, Managing Purchase Orders. Purchase orders are not transactions. They will not affect the chart of accounts, nor the customer or vendor's balances, nor the inventory quantity on hand. They are documents we make to record the request of inventory that we need to purchase from the vendors. The purchase order reports help us track what was requested and help us compare that to what we already received. You must first activate the purchase order feature in the account settings window. So let's do that now. Now, before we go to do that, let's prove to you that right now there are no purchase orders available and no purchase order reports available before we change the settings. If you go to the top left and you click New, you will see that you are not able to create a purchase order because it is not available. You will also notice if you click Reports, and go to the standard section of reports, you will not see purchase order reports anywhere in the list of reports because purchase orders have not yet been activated. Now we will activate the purchase order feature. Go to the top right and click the cog wheel. And then go over to the left and click account settings. If you remember the earlier videos, you remember that you click a category on the left to be able to activate a feature within that category. And then, of course, you can change categories by clicking a different category. In this case, click Expenses, and where it says Use Purchase Orders, it says Off. Click on the word Off, and it gives you the ability to click the check mark here so that you will use and activate the features of purchase orders. Then click Save, and now your account has the purchase order features. If we close the Account Settings window, we can go back to Reports, Standard, and scroll up very slowly, and you will see you now have Open Purchase Order Report, Open Purchase Order List, and open purchase order detail. And these two reports will help you manage your purchase orders. So let's go ahead and pin them to the uh, custom reports area. Click open purchase order and then change the pull down to all dates. Then click run report. And now that the open purchase order detail looks the way we need it to look, we will click Save Customization, and then click Save, and then you will see if you click Reports, Custom Reports, we now have 
open purchase order detail on our list of custom reports that we can get to right away. Now, how do you manage the purchase orders? Well, the open purchase order report will show the remaining items waiting to be received. The transaction list by vendor that we already put up in the custom area in a previous video, that will show us the full amount of all purchase orders regardless. And you'll see that after we enter our first purchase orders. For example, let's imagine on January 13th, we ordered 100 bananas from Sam's Farm. January 13th, we ordered 100 bananas from Sam's Farm. Now when we go to the top left and click New, we now have Purchase Order available in the middle of the Vendor column. So click Purchase Order, and we'll just read off the information. And it's just like any other document that we made in QuickBooks Online. The date is January 13th of 2020. The vendor is Sam's Farm. Now, we don't want categories for expenses, so you can click this to collapse it. We want item details. Click the triangle for the items. Click under the words products and services, bananas 100. So we choose bananas 100. No, oh, excuse me, not a thousand, a hundred. Notice QuickBooks knows and remembers that we pay $20 each crate of banana and we're buying a hundred bananas. When we click save and close, we can now check our open purchase order report and you can see that we have one purchase order opened on January 13th, purchase order number one for Sam's Farm. Scroll to the right, and you can see the total is 2,000, and the quantity that we ordered is 100. Let's do the next one. January 14th, 100 apples from Addie's Orchard. Same thing. Click New, Purchase Order, January 14th. Addie's Orchard, Apples, 100. QuickBooks remembers the purchase cost. Click Save and Close. And now we have two open purchase orders for two different items waiting to be received from vendors. And these two purchase orders have not yet affected our chart of accounts our vendors balances or the inventory quantity the quantity has not changed because we have not yet received the orders now we will receive the order and when we receive the order it's very simple as soon as we put the vendor name in the check bill or expense that we record when we receive the order the open purchase order will appear in the right panel as we make the transaction. If that check, bill, or expense is for that order, you can save time by just clicking on the order and it will transfer the data to the transaction. As soon as you save the transaction, the purchase order will disappear from the open purchase order report because it will no longer be open. So for example, Let's imagine on January 15th, we received order number one from Sam, and we received it with a bill, which means we're going to pay for it later. So if we receive the order with a bill, what we do is we go to the top left and click New, and we go down and we click Bill. Now this is, oh wait, wait, we received it first of all on the 15th, but watch this. As soon as we choose Sam's Farm, Sam's Farm, notice the purchase order appeared in the right panel as soon as we chose the vendor that we had an open purchase order with. If you want to view it, you can click open, but let's not do that. Let's just click add. 
and no matter what was on the purchase order, it automatically, here, let's close the category. No matter what was on the purchase order, it will automatically record it and copy it over. So if you had 10 items on a purchase order with a lot of details, just click add and it all gets transferred over to the bill. Now the only other thing you have to do is put the bill number and then when you click save and close you can go back to the open purchase order report and you can see the purchase order for Sam has disappeared from the open purchase order report because it is no longer open we received it with a bill however if you still need to see that purchase order and it's not on the open purchase order detail then it is in the transaction list by vendor click reports go down to transaction list by vendor and click on it and when you go to Sam's farm you can see the bill and you can see the purchase order itself the purchase order will still be in the list of transactions on this report transaction list by vendor but look what happens when I double click and open it up when I double click and open it up uh, it uh, it doesn't really uh, it says one linked transaction and closed and if it says closed that indicates that you've already received this order you should also check reports inventory valuation detail so that you can see for this bill on the 14th the bill we got for bananas from Sam's farm you can see that the quantity of inventory did increase and rest assured all the accounts that come with it or that follow along with a bill will change as well as the vendors balance just like we learned in a previous video now this is interesting on January 16th we received only 50 of the hundred apples from order number two from January 14th to Addy the order that we sent to Addy so we're going to do this again except this time um, we're going to pay her immediately with check number 61 and at the moment we go to record the check when we choose Addy the purchase order will show up in the right panel and we will have to adjust the quantity ourselves watch this we click new go to vendors and click check now the date of the check is January 15th but look what happens when we choose Addie's Orchard QuickBooks remembers that we have an unpaid bill with her as well as an open purchase order with this vendor and because we are receiving this purchase order we click open Oh, excuse me click no not open not open because then we'll leave this sorry sorry click add so we added the purchase order let's close the categories and keep the items we added the purchase order and if it, there were many items it would all transfer over and save us time let's click quantity and change it to the amount that we actually physically received push the tab key after typing in the field and now the check is the correct amount five hundred dollars now when we click save and close we can see that the Apple quantity did increase by 50 for the check which means the accounts and the chart of accounts changed the way they did in previous videos but the most important thing to look at is to click reports open purchase order detail and you can see that Addy's purchase order is still open and it is still on this report but it says quantity received 50 scroll over a little back ordered 50 and here's the total amount and of course you can double click and you can open it up and see it's still open and when you come down you can see the original amount of a hundred and the amount you received so far so that's how you will use purchase orders to track your orders from vendors for your merchandise inventory. Chapter 16, Adjusting Inventory Quantity.
Normally, the quantity of inventory would only change for purchases, sales, and returns. However, sometimes there are special situations that could change the quantity of your inventory items without buying, selling, or returning the items. When these special situations happen that change the quantity, you must make an inventory adjustment to correct the quantity of inventory in your records. Examples of situations that you would have to adjust for are theft. If somebody steals some of your apples or bananas, the quantity changed in your warehouse without buying, selling, or returning and you have to adjust so that QuickBooks knows the correct amount that you have after the theft. Same thing with a casualty loss like flood, earthquake, fire, tornado, any kind of thing that changes your inventory quantity you would have to adjust for. What about spoilage? If you're dealing with food, sometimes the food spoils before you get a chance to sell it and sometimes your merchandise becomes obsolete if other products or services come out in the market as a result you can't sell what you have on hand so you just get rid of it your inventory also could increase if somebody actually gives you for free merchandise that you can turn around and sell so these are things that you would have to adjust for that would change the quantity of inventory without buying, selling, or returning the items. You must have an account in the chart of accounts for each reason that inventory is adjusted. The account that you adjust for or that you use to make the adjustment is not normal income or normal expense you must put them as type other income or other expense. These items appear at the bottom of the profit and loss and they're not part of your normal operating income but of course they will affect your overall net income. And some examples of the accounts in the chart of accounts would be loss on inventory theft, loss on inventory spoilage, and income from donated inventory that we received. Let's take a moment and put these three accounts in our chart of accounts. We go to the left and we click accounting chart of accounts. Now that we're in the chart of accounts we go to the top right and click new. Now the first one scroll all the way down to get other expense and it doesn't really matter the sub uh, the uh, detail type but I guess you could just basically choose um, uh, exchange gain or loss because that's really the closest one but in this case the detail type won't really matter and we want to name it loss on inventory theft Click Save and New because we're going to do two more. The next one will be Loss on Inventory Spoilage. So again, this would be Other Expense, not Expense, and probably the most appropriate detail type would simply be Other Miscellaneous Expense. And you would name it Loss on Inventory Spoilage. and you would click Save and New. Now this next one would not be Income, it would be Other Income because it's not part of your normal operations. Income from inven donated inventory received. Choose Other Miscellaneous Income You can name it anything you like as long as you know what it is. 
Now click Save and Close and now we have the accounts on the list to be able to make the inventory adjustments. Now let's do our example. Let's imagine on January 16th we opened the inventory warehouse and observed that 10 bananas have spoiled and cannot be sold. Well before you record this make sure you click reports and open your inventory valuation detail so you can see right now how many bananas do we have on hand. On hand it says we have 180 bananas. So it will decrease to 170. Actually, yes, it will decrease by 10. So in order to make the adjustment on January 16th, we click New and then go all the way to the right and go down to Inventory Quantity Adjustment. Now the date that we are adjusting for is January 16th because that's the day we observed it and the account that will hold the money that we lost on the bananas that we spent would be the other expense account loss on inventory spoilage. Now click under the word product and choose bananas. Now the you have a choice when you put in the number. If you want you could put the change in quantity as negative 10 and push tab and it will automatically calculate the new quantity. Or you can change the new quantity, or, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's change that back. Let's put this back to zero. That means that your other choice is to simply type in the new quantity and push tab and QuickBooks will calculate the change. So it's up to you which one you want to put in. When you put in one, it will automatically calculate and change the other. Now when we click Save and Close we can look at the bottom of bananas and you can see that on January 16th we adjusted inventory we have 10 fewer bananas and that we lost $200 worth of bananas in that spoilage. And in order to prove that we would click Reports and go down to the Trial Balance and you can see loss on inventory spoilage would show up for the very first time as two hundred dollars. The next example would be January 17th. We opened the inventory warehouse and observed that five apples have been stolen. Well, you would do the exact same thing. You would click New, go to Inventory Quantity Adjustment, put the date as January 17th, Make sure you choose the correct adjustment account and in this case loss on inventory theft so that we know exactly how much money we lost for what we paid for the merchandise that was stolen. And in this case what was stolen was were five apples. So we choose apples. Now we could put the new quantity as 164 or you could just put minus 5 and push tab and QuickBooks will calculate 164. It's the same thing. So it is that easy to adjust. Click Save and Close and now you can see for the very first time loss on inventory theft shows up for the first time as $50 and if you click Reports and look at your inventory valuation detail you see on January 17th we lost five apples as a result of the theft and the quantity on hand decreased to 164. Lastly, let's imagine on January 18th someone gave Holden, the owner, I think the owner is Vonda, not, I don't know who's the owner, but the crates of bananas, 10 crates of bananas that he can re resell were given to him as a birthday gift. Well that counts as income. It might not be taxable income but from the point of view of the business it's donated income not part of the normal income from operations. So all you have to do is go to the top left and click New, Inventory Adjust, put 
the date that you got and put into the warehouse the new bananas and this time it's the other income account that you will choose income from inventory that was donated to the company and in this case the product was bananas and the change in quantity is now a positive number I believe they gave 10 yes they did so the quantity of bananas increases from 170 to 180 that might even be the guy that stole the 10 bananas to turn around and give it back to him uh, I don't know save and close now we look at the bottom of bananas and we see that the quantity on hand increased by 10 for twenty dollars each because that's what we would normally buy it for so he has income of two hundred and you can click reports and look at the trial balance and see income from inventory donated uh, can we make this column bigger maybe and you can click reports profit and loss and notice these things are at the very bottom in other words the here's the net income from normal operations from buying and selling look here's the difference between your buying and selling and then here are your other operating expenses so here's your net income from normal operations and then you would add income and expenses that you had that were not from normal operations to get your ultimate net income. Chapter 17, Managing Prepaid Inventory. When you pay in advance, meaning long before you receive the merchandise, not just one or two days, let's say two or three weeks, the quantity of inventory should not change until the items are actually received. You must have an account to track what is paid for and what you expect to receive in the future regarding your prepaid inventory. This account increases when you prepay for inventory and decreases when you actually receive the inventory and again if you're going to receive the inventory just two or three days after paying you can ignore this video and just record it the way we did in earlier videos but if you're going to receive your inventory several weeks after paying you really need to do the procedures that will be shown here the prepaid inventory account should be a current asset and that's because it represents what you will receive in the future like accounts receivable now you have to understand that in QuickBooks Online if QuickBooks Online does not have a feature for everything you need to do you have to do something called a workaround no accounting program comes with a feature to track prepaid inventory. A workaround means that you will use QuickBooks Online slightly differently from the normal way in order to properly account for this issue, the lack of prepaid inventory feature. So what do you do? Well, this method is called the Mark Smolin method because I'm Mark Smolin and I invented this method and it has worked perfectly for my clients that use inventory starting from the late 90s. Prepaid inventory when you put it on the list must be a bank type of account and when you pay you pay from the normal bank account and put prepaid inventory in the category field when you receive the inventory that was paid for you use the expense window and put the prepaid inventory account in the top field and choose the items that you receive at the bottom of the window then you will make extensive use of the description field and that will help you track the details of prepaid inventory then you can open the account from the trial balance to see the description of each transaction.
So here's a set of five things that you do under the Mark Smolin method that will guarantee that you have total control of your prepaid inventory and your books and records will be correct at any given moment. So before our example, let's go ahead and create the prepaid inventory account in the chart of accounts. You click in the left panel where it says accounting chart of accounts. Then you go to the top right and click new. Now it's a bank type of account and again the detail type really doesn't matter. You can put checking, money market, savings, trust account, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the name is And this account will show up on your trial balance and balance sheet and it will represent the amount that you paid for inventory that you expect to receive in the future. Click Save and Close and now you're all set up. Now, let's do our example transactions. Let's imagine on January 19th we paid Addie's Orchard in advance for 200 apples to be received in the future and we paid it with check number 62. Well it's very simple. You go to the top left and click new and come over and write check. Now this is check number 62 whatever. You paid Addie's Orchard. Now you even though you have a purchase order and a bill ignore it don't worry about it this prepaid inventory is not related to these two so you can just ignore that uh, you can just uh, scroll to the right for the rest of the stuff so the date I believe was January 19th so put the date that you actually paid now you will not put the items on the day that you prepay for the inventory you do not put the detail of the items because the quantity in your records should not change because you do not yet have them available for sale. Instead click category and the account that you choose in the category should be prepaid inventory. And it should be up here, here it is, prepaid inventory. There you go and the money amount that you paid well you'll have to calculate it yourself because you're not using the quantity feature because you don't have it available so 200 apples and we usually pay ten dollars each so in America 200 times 10 would mean that we're writing a check for two thousand dollars and again you would have to calculate it yourself because we're not yet using the quantity and we're not yet using the quantity because they're not yet available for sale. You can hide this by pushing this little thing, by the way. Okay, so now you have the $2,000 check and then when you click Save and Close, now when you click Reports, Trial Balance, your trial balance is correct. Your trial balance has a receivable account, an asset, with the value that you will receive in the future for two thousand dollars and if you made a balance sheet and reported your numbers right now that would be a correct number now in order to help you track the details we are going to create a custom report from this prepaid inventory let's double click the number and notice that you have all of this as your detail for your prepaid inventory. I have to scroll left and right because uh, you know what I could do? I could expand this a bit here so that you can see because the most important thing is the memo description and if we double click we notice that you can put in the description the details of what you are purchasing. You can put 200 apples check number 62 on the date 119 
so that you know when you look at the report, you can see the details of what you were paying for. And let's click Save and Close. So notice the description will tell you the details of each transaction that's in the prepaid inventory account. And now that the account looks the way we want it to look, we will click Save Customization, and instead of calling Transaction Report, we will instead call it Prepaid Inventory Details. and then click Save. Now if you click Reports, you can click Prepaid Inventory, oops, excuse me, Prepaid Inventory Details, and you will see each transaction that affected your prepaid inventory account, and the memo will explain the transactions so you know exactly what you're expecting in the future. Now let's imagine on January 20th, you actually received the apples from Addy that were paid for on January 19th. Now, here's where the workaround comes in. You click New from the top left, and then you choose Expense. Now, here's where the workaround comes in. You don't actually have an expense. In fact, there really is no payee. All you have to do is make sure that you pay from the prepaid inventory account because the balance is 2000 of what you're expecting and now you use the items instead of the category and you choose apples. And we are assuming we received all of the apples. We are assuming we received 200, you type in how many you received. So you see the prepaid inventory account is going down because now we received them and the actual inventory account is going up in addition to the quantity that is now available for sale. And of course the day that we physically received them and made them available for sale in our inventory is January 20th. Click Save and Close and if we click Reports, Trial Balance, you will see that the results are exactly as they should be. Prepaid inventory goes down to zero because we don't have any prepaid inventory anymore. Instead, we have more of this inventory asset. And if you double click and scroll down to the bottom, you can see the January 20 entry increases the inventory asset by 2000 and then if you click reports inventory valuation detail you can see that the January 20th entry increases the quantity of apples by 200 and that's exactly what is supposed to happen so this workaround with these procedures will work perfectly the only other thing you have to remember let's double click and open it up Let's remember to add a description from you have to put those details in there and click save and close. Why do you have to put the details in the description of every transaction that involves prepaid inventory? That's because when you click reports and you look at your prepaid inventory details, you want to see the description of what happened. So uh, I don't know why it didn't show up there. Let's double click. Maybe there's another description field down here. Uh, but anyway, put in the description so that you can open it up and you can see all the details so that you can know why prepaid inventory changed the way it did. And that will help you somewhat track the quantity of what you're expecting to receive. Now, let's imagine on January 21st, we paid Sam's Farm in advance for 150 bananas with check number 63. Again, 
you will have to calculate the money amounts yourself. I happen to know that 150 bananas paid $20 each means that check number 63 to Sam will be $3,000. So let's click New, Check, January 21st to Sam's Farm, and we can just close this because this bill is irrelevant. And this time we're using category, not item details, and we're going to put prepaid inventory. Here it is. Good. And we're going to put 3,000 that we calculate ourselves, and in the description field, 150 bananas from 121 check number 63. You can put whatever details help you when you reopen it. Now when you click Save and Close, you can click Reports, Trial Balance, and you will see that $3,000 is the amount of inventory, the money amount that we paid for inventory that we expect in the future that we will receive. Now here's where it gets interesting. January 22nd, let's say we received only 100 from the bananas from Sam that was paid from check number 63. Well, we're going to do the same procedure. We click New, Expense, and the day we received those 100 bananas was January 22nd. So we will put January 22nd. There is no payee because we're not paying anybody. And we're going to put only, well, this, this is bananas, but we're only going to put the quantity of what was physically received. Because on January 22nd, we only increased the items that are available for sale by 100 because that's what we received. But you can put the details in the description. From 121, check 63, only 150 pending. Put those details of the quantity in the description field so that your prepaid account will be clear. Now, the account that we're paying from, good. The account that we're paying from is prepaid inventory. Because we already paid for these, we're simply lowering prepaid inventory for the amount we physically received. When we click Save and Close, the trial balance is correct. Now we only expect to receive in the future $1,000 worth of merchandise that we paid $1,000 for and the inventory asset increased, see the very last transaction, the inventory asset increased, and you can see the details, it increased by $2,000, and then you can see, you know, you, you're supposed to be able to make this column wider, so that you can see all the details of what happened with your prepaid inventory. And you can click reports, and you can click inventory valuation detail and see that from the event recorded on January 22nd you increased by a hundred a quantity of a hundred how many bananas you have that you paid twenty dollars each for and lastly you can go down to the prepaid inventory details and you can see on January 22nd prepaid inventory decreased by 2000 and I regret that it's not showing the memo description but you could just double click and you could see why it increased only by 2000 and that you have 50 pending from check number 63 that you expect to receive in the future and lastly let's consider the January 23rd refund from Sam 
for the remaining items that we did not yet receive. Let's imagine on January 23rd, Sam gave us check number 1234 for the other 50 bananas that we paid for that we did not yet receive. Well, in this case, we'll know the money amount because it'll be written on the check, and we will know the reason. But I happen to know that 50 bananas at $20 each means he returned $1,000 to us and that we deposited that $1,000 check on January 23rd. Now, if we deposit the refund check, it means the prepaid inventory is no longer in existence because we are no longer expecting to receive $1,000 in prepaid inventory. If we click Reports, Trial Balance, it says we expect to receive $1,000 worth of inventory or $1,000 of inventory that we paid $1,000 for, we're expecting to receive in the future. Instead, he refunded it to us. So we simply make a deposit and we choose the prepaid inventory account. Click New and we click Bank Deposit. Now, the account that we are depositing to is our normal operating account. And we received this from Sam's Farm and the account that is being affected by this deposit is in fact our prepaid in our prepaid inventory uh, account here it is prepaid inventory make extensive use of the description field you know whatever the information you want to put and then just put the amount of the actual check so on the day that our be oh, sorry and we received that on January 23rd so on the day that our bank account goes up by the refund check of a thousand uh, uh, from Sam prepaid inventory goes down because we no longer have that asset that we will receive in the future and if you click save and close you see that the bank account is $1,000 less negative in our little story, but prepaid inventory went down to zero the way it should be. And if we open the reports, we can look at the prepaid inventory details, and we can see that that deposit and the explanation, you know, you can, you can stretch the memo a little bit wider if you want you can memorize it after you stretch the memo wider so you can see the details of the quantity that you got refunded for and why you no longer have prepaid inventory chapter 19 the periodic inventory system we know that all merchandise stores including an essential Amazon store would calculate their profit in this way. First, they would find out the total money that comes in from the customer, and that would be sales income. Then they would subtract what they paid for the merchandise that they gave the customer, and that is called the cost of goods sold. After you subtract what came in from the customer, minus what you paid for the merchandise that you gave the customer, then you would know your gross profit. And in this video, we will learn how to calculate the middle number, the cost of goods sold. What is the periodic inventory system? Well, you cannot know your profit unless you know how many items were sold during the month and how much money of item costs were sold during the month. In other words, how much you paid specifically for the products that you gave the customers. Most Amazon sellers do not keep count of the quantity of items after each sale or after each purchase. 
So how do you know how many items and how much money of inventory was sold during the month? The solution is to use old school elementary steps to basically back into the amount of cost of goods sold during the month. So what does that mean? Well, let's think of it from an elementary school's point of view. Let's imagine at the beginning of the month you had some inventory. For example, you had 10 items. Then let's imagine during the month you bought more and you kept track of how many you bought during the month and that was 20 items. Now you don't know exactly how many you sold because you did not keep quantities of that which were sold but what you can do is physically count the ones that remain and are with you at the end of the month and if you count the amount at the end of the month in this example and you have five items left over how would you find out how many actually were sold and went out well in order to know that you would have to be able to add the first two numbers together in other words you would have to find out how many you were able to sell and then of course you would subtract out the amount that you did not sell which is the amount left over so if we were able to sell 30 and we did not sell 5 then how many did we actually sell and of course the answer is 25 logically if we had some for example in this example we had 15 at the beginning of the month then during the month we bought 45 more well we don't know how many were sold but we know we can physically count the ones that are left over at the end of the month and in this example there were 25 left over so remember in order to find out how many you did sell the first step is finding out how many you were able to sell and in this example you were able to sell 60 and had 25 left over so in this example how many did you sell well you sold 35 because 60 that you were able to sell minus 25 that you did not sell because 25 was left over logically equals the 35 that you did sell and now we will do the same thing we just did but we will do it with money amounts instead of counted quantities for example let's imagine at the beginning of the month we knew we had two hundred and fifty dollars worth of merchandise inventory that means we paid two hundred and fifty dollars for the items that were sitting here at the beginning of the month then during the month we kept track of how much we paid to buy more inventory and therefore we know the money amount that we were able to sell we could also check the amount left over in ending inventory and figure out what we paid for that so we know the money amount of what remains and logically we could figure out the money amount of the goods that were sold and we know in this example it was 300 because $800 worth of inventory that we were able to sell minus $500 worth of inventory that we did not sell equals $300 worth of inventory that we did sell and since we paid the cost for that $300 that we did sell the $300 in this example is the cost of goods sold and now we will do the same thing we've been doing but using the proper accounting words for example instead of saying we had some we're going to say beginning inventory was two hundred and fifty dollars worth of merchandise and instead of saying we bought more 
we'll call the amount that we bought more the very important word purchases. So these are the words that we would use when doing accounting and calculating our cost of goods sold. Now, the word able is in the phrase able to sell. So instead of saying the amount we were able to sell, the official word for this number is goods available for sale. And of course, instead of saying the amount left over, we call the amount left over ending inventory. So what's the proper word for the result? Well, the result is what you paid for the goods that you sold and went out. So if in this example, $300 worth of merchandise went out, then that's what we call the cost of goods sold. Because $300 is what we paid for what went out, because in this example, $800 worth of merchandise is what we were able to sell, that was the goods available for sale. 500 is what we did not sell, that was the ending inventory. So logically, we sold $300 worth of merchandise, and 300 is the cost of goods sold. Now let's do another example with the proper words. Beginning inventory was 400. Then during the month we purchased $350 more worth of inventory. And when we physically count the inventory at the end, we know we have $150 worth of inventory still sitting here. So of course the next step is to find out how much money worth of inventory we were able to sell, and that's the goods available for sale. So beginning inventory plus purchases equals goods available for sale, and goods available for sale minus ending inventory equals the cost of goods sold. And in this example, it is $600, because $750 were the goods available for sale, $150 was the ending inventory, therefore the cost of goods sold in this example was $600. Now, we need to know the cost of goods sold so that we can subtract it from the money that came in in sales income to calculate the gross profit. Because common sense dictates the money that came in from sales minus the cost of goods sold, which is what we paid, equals the profit on the sales of the merchandise. So how was this done in the old days in the chart of accounts? Well, the sales were recorded this way. We had a separate account in the chart of accounts just to record all the money that came in from sales. And only the money amounts that the customers paid us got recorded in the sales income account because that was recorded at the same time in the cash and bank account that we used in our general ledger to keep track of how much money we had in the bank. So we knew if it came in and it was a plus to the bank account that it was also sales income. And each individual sale was recorded on the credit side of the sales account to keep track of the income and the debit side of the cash and bank account to keep track of how much money was in the bank or came into the bank account. Then, of course, at the end of the month, we would total the money that came in from the sale, and that amount would be the sales income that we would subtract out the cost of goods sold to find the profit. So then you may ask, how were purchases recorded? Well, we had a separate account to record the money amount each time we purchased inventory, and of course, that was matched to the deduction of the bank account every time we paid for the purchase. And in the purchases account, we only put the purchase cost. We only put what we paid for the merchandise that we purchased. And every time we did that, we put a 
of the money amount on the debit side of purchases to keep track of everything we paid and the credit side of the cash and bank to keep track of each reduction to the bank account and after each purchase was recorded in the purchases account during the month at the end of the month we would get the total purchases and the total purchases would help us find the cost of goods sold to be able to subtract from the sales income to be able to determine our profit but we know that what we paid for the purchases is not exactly equal to what we pay to, to what the cost of goods sold is so how did we actually find the cost of goods sold well we had our purchases account and we had another account to keep track of the inventory which is an asset and that account kept track of what's physically here at the end of one month and the beginning of another and then of course we had a separate T account just to show us the amount of cost of goods sold and what would we do well we would start with the beginning inventory that means that if we looked at the inventory asset account in our chart of accounts at any given moment it would only show the amount of inventory we had at the beginning of the month now let's just remind ourselves what the calculation was beginning inventory plus purchases equals goods available for sale goods available for sale minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold so the first thing we would do is remove the beginning balance from inventory asset and move it to cost of goods sold. We would do that by making a credit to the inventory asset to wipe it out because that's no longer the inventory amount. That was the amount at the beginning. So since the number at the end of the month is not the same, we make a credit to wipe it out and the balancing debit goes into the account cost of goods sold now the inventory asset is zero after step one now what would be step two move the purchases to cost of goods sold purchases normally had a debit balance so we made a credit to wipe it out and make purchases zero so that we could account for only the purchases in each individual month and purchases will become zero as a fresh balance to record the purchases in the next month and the balancing debit of course goes to cost of goods sold now cost of goods sold now has this final third step the ending inventory will go as a decrease to cost of goods sold and we know the amount that we physically count at the end which is the amount left over gets subtracted in our little calculation so that's why it goes on the credit side of cost of goods sold because it gets subtracted and of course the balancing debit goes into the asset account inventory so that now is the ending inventory of this month and now going into the next month the inventory account reflects what's the beginning inventory in the new month and now our cost of goods sold account in the chart of accounts has every part of the calculation on the left it has the beginning inventory and the purchases so the total on the left is the goods available for sale and we know that on the right side it has what's left over that we subtract out as the ending inventory so when we take the total debit side of cost of goods sold minus the total credit side of cost of goods sold we get the actual balance of cost of goods sold and in this example that's eight thousand dollars and that's how we found out the cost of goods sold by managing the chart of accounts in the days before the computer.
And that cost of goods sold is what we would subtract from the sales income to get the gross profit from buying and selling merchandise. After that, we would subtract our general administrative expenses to get the net taxable income. Now here's a practical example of how you would use the periodic inventory system. It's an excerpt from the Amazon online store owner course that is already up and showing here on YouTube. And it shows exactly how to apply the ideas of the periodic inventory system to properly calculate your monthly profit and loss. If you look at the prior video, the one that we recorded the deposit from or the deposit statement these were your accounts in the chart of accounts and it was that account product charges that represents the sales that is what represented the money that came in from the customers now we must add three additional accounts to the chart of accounts in order to be able to have QuickBooks find your cost of goods sold. First, we have to put an account called Inventory Asset, and that's a current asset. And if you watched the prior video, then you know that that represents the beginning inventory of one month, which is the same as the ending inventory of the next month. Actually, it's vice versa. The ending inventory of one month which is the beginning inventory of another month. In the left panel, click Accounting, Chart of Accounts. Now, QuickBooks already comes with a lot of accounts, so you might already have an inventory asset on your list. If not, then click New, and the account type would be Other Current Asset, and the detail type would be Inventory, and you could leave the name We'll type hours in capital to indicate that we typed it in. Now, save and new. The other account we have to add is a purchases account. That account will represent the total money spent on new inventory during the current month. And the type of account that it should be is cost of goods sold. Now again, QuickBooks comes with, let me show you, QuickBooks comes with a lot of accounts already. So you might already have an account called Purchases. The problem is that the category is Expense. So we have to edit the account because we don't want it to be an expense. We want it to be part of the cost of goods sold calculation. So if you already have it in your chart of accounts, just change the account type and again, the detail type really doesn't matter. As long as it's a cost of goods sold account, it will appear in the correct place of your profit and loss. So we click Save and New. And then we click Yes. Now, the last account that we have to add is Cost of Goods Sold. That's the actual account that will show up in the income section of your profit and loss. And the type also has to be cost of goods sold. And again, it's possible, it's possible that you might already have it depending on your subscription. So we already have an account called cost of goods sold, which is type cost of goods sold. So if you don't have it, you would create it like this. You would click account new, and it would be cost of goods sold type of account. And of course, it wouldn't really matter, and you would type in cost of goods sold. And after you click Save and New, we can't because we already have one. After you save it, you will then have the accounts you need to make your monthly adjustment to find your profit. Now, if you remember our example statement deposit in the prior video, that date was April 3rd of 2019. So we are imagining that our example month was April 3rd of 2019. 
That was shown in a prior video. But the prior deposit recorded sales, meaning the income, into an account called product charges. That was our income from sales account. Everything else that we recorded in the previous video was listed as an expense that lowered the profit on the profit and loss. We should, however, in a real situation, have had an April 1 inventory asset with a balance coming from the previous month. In other words, we were pretending that April of 2019 was the very first month that we uh, started doing uh, business with Amazon. But if it were not, then we would have had a balance in the inventory account that represented the end of March balance, which is the same as the beginning of the April balance. That was, would, that's what would have been the situation if we were doing this continuously. So what we have to do in order to make this example understandable is to put in April's beginning balance. You will not do this in real life. I'm only doing this now so we can pretend that we had a balance in inventory on April 1 that came from the end of March. Because if we had a balance on April 1, we would then be able to see the full set of adjustments for the cost of goods sold calculation. And by the way, if you started your business with inventory on hand, the adjustment I'm about to show you would be the adjustment you would make to acknowledge that you had inventory on hand before you started selling on Amazon. So we are pretending that we had that we paid $4,000 for the beginning inventory. And this is the way you would do it. You would click New, and you'd go over to Journal Entry. Now, the date, of course, will be April 1 of 2019. And the account would be our inventory asset, okay, uh, I guess inventory, current asset, and we would debit the account for the amount that we started doing business with at the moment we started doing business. And any accountant will tell you that if you're doing a setup journal entry, which is what this is, the balancing account is opening balance equity. And then we would just click save and close. So that's what you would do only if you had inventory on hand before you started doing business with Amazon. And now our beginning inventory is set up. In fact, let's take a look at the trial balance. You can see that inventory April 1, which is what we are pretending that we finished with for the end of March, is $4,000. And of course, opening balance equity, that's just the account we use to balance out setup adjustments. Now we're going to really pretend that we're at the end of April and we have to adjust inventory to find our cost of goods sold and our gross profit. So now let's record purchases of inventory during April. So we set up the beginning inventory for beginning of April. Then we recorded the deposit on April 3rd. Now we're recording purchases during April. So let's imagine during April we purchased inventory twice. First on April 9 we paid Maggie the Merchant a thousand dollars for inventory that we planned to sell. Well that's very simple. We click New, Expense, and don't worry about this, and if Maggie the Merchant is not on the list we click Add New and we type in her name. And then we click Save. Uh, by the way, she's a vendor. We click Save. Good. Now, the date that we purchased from her is April 9th, and we choose the Purchases account. 
because that's the account that we record the purchases in. And we paid $1,000 to Maggie on April 9th for the merchandise that we intend to sell. Save and close. And you can see purchases shows up for the first time as $1,000. Now, let's imagine on April 26th, we paid Maggie again for $1,500 more of inventory that we plan on selling on Amazon. So we do the same thing. New, expense, and that was April uh, 26th. So we change this to April 26th. Maggie the Merchant. Uh, just click no, just in case. In other words, they would put the purchases account, but then they would put the previous money amount, which I don't think is helpful. So purchases, and this time it was 50, oh, excuse me, excuse me. Just 1500 that we purchased on April 26, save and close. So it says that during the month we purchased $2,500 worth of merchandise that we paid $2,500 for that we plan on selling. Now before we move on to step three, let's do this. Reports, standard, and let's put the good profit and loss up there. This one, profit and loss, choose all dates, and run report. Now you can see that the purchases is part of the income section. This is what the customers gave us, and this is what we paid for. So the gross profit that's showing now is not accurate. It only takes into consideration the purchases. It doesn't yet take into consideration the difference between the beginning and ending inventory. We need to do that in order to really find out our cost of goods sold and our gross profit. But in the meantime, let's click Save Customization and click Save because it's better to have that one. Now when we click Reports and Custom, this profit and loss I think is a little better for a yes. So again, the cost of goods sold section is not correct and complete until we do our final inventory adjustment. And now let's finally calculate the gross profit and net income from April by doing three journal entry adjustments. We will assume that no other deposits from Amazon happened in April just to make things easy and clear even though we know we would probably have one more statement to put in. So we will make three journal entries and the dates of those journal entries must be dated the last day of the month. First, we will move beginning inventory to cost of goods sold. So if we look at the trial balance, we can see in this example, beginning inventory is 4000 on the debit side. So we will make a credit to move it out of inventory because it's no longer the amount in, in, in inventory at the end of April. So we re remove all of it by making a credit and the balancing debit goes to the cost of goods sold account. New journal entry. You must put the date, the last day of the month that you're measuring the income from. The account is inventory and we are making a credit of whatever the beginning balance is to wipe it out because the beginning balance is no longer correct. And the balancing debit goes into cost of goods sold. Then click Save and New. Now, on the same date, we have to move the balance of purchases to cost of goods sold in the exact same way. If we look at the trial balance now, purchases is 2500 and it's on the debit side. So we have to wipe it out and make it zero so that it can start fresh measuring the purchases for only May. 
So we have to credit purchases to wipe out the debit balance. We click New, Journal Entry, QuickBooks remembers April 30th, Purchases, and we will make a credit to wipe it out. Purchases must start with zero at the beginning of the month so that when you look at purchases, you know how much was purchased during one specific month. And the balancing debit goes to cost of goods sold and save and new. Now, in order to do the third one, you would have to physically count the ending inventory at the end of April. Let's imagine you physically count your inventory as of April 30 and determine that you have you paid $3,000 for the merchandise that is sitting there with you at exactly on April 30. Well, inventory right now after the first adjustment has a zero balance because we wiped it out. So we have to put this 3,000 into inventory because that's how much we have at the end. So we're going to debit inventory and credit cost of goods sold. April 30, inventory is debit for what we physically have. And the balancing credit is cost of goods sold. Now, when we click save and close, we can come back to the profit and loss. And you can see the real cost of goods sold was $3,500. So $13,659.22 is what customers gave us for merchandise that we paid $3,500 for. And those three journal entries helped us find out that we actually paid $3,500 for the merchandise they gave us thirteen six fifty nine for that means our real gross profit is ten thousand one fifty nine and when we subtract out all the other expenses our net income at the end of the month is five thousand two hundred fifteen dollars and fifty two cents thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of this quickbooks online inventory video you should have confidence that you now know everything you need to know regarding managing merchandise inventory in QuickBooks Online. I hope you will remember to click like after watching each of the videos here on this channel and please stay in touch.